Good morning all, I hope you can hear me. It seems that there's an internet connection problem. It's blocking the platform at the university. So um, I'm Isabel from Betlink and I'm just gonna start our first session's presentations. Please use the chat box for questions if you have any and we hope to sort this out soon. Thank you everyone for your patience. Good morning, I'm presenting my MAVET research to you today, which involved establishing an ACTH reference interval for South African horses. ACTH is involved in pituitary pars intermedia dysfunction, PPID, which is a serious endocrine condition in horses that is overrepresented in older horses, ponies, and morgans. The pathognomonic sign for this condition is hypotrichosis, seen in this 32 year old horse presented for laminitis. Melanotropes in the pars intermedia are stimulated by serotonin and inhibited by dopamine, both produced by neurons in the hypothalamus. PPID is a neurodegenerative disease with the primary pathomechanism being disruption of normal dopaminergic inhibition of the function of the melanotropes in the pars intermedia of the pituitary gland. The dopaminergic neurons undergo oxidation as part of the normal aging process, resulting in degeneration. In PPID, additional mitochondrial dysfunction and inflammation have also been implicated in the expression and accumulation of alpha-synuclein, further exacerbating this neurodegeneration. Comparisons have been made with Parkinson's disease in people, although degeneration and loss of dopaminergic inhibition here occurs in a different part of the brain. In this diagram, the blue crosses represent loss of dopaminergic inhibition, which leads to hyperplasia of melanotropes in the pars intermedia, which in turn leads to increased production of PUMCs indicated by blue arrows or ticks. The secondary consequences of this are indicated by the red arrows and include an increase in all POMC-derived peptides. ACTH is only one of these peptides that is increased in PPID, but it is the only one that we can measure routinely and is thus the most well known. CPID diagnosis is commonly initially based on clinical signs and on ACTH concentration, which is interpreted against reference intervals or diagnostic cutoffs. ACTH concentration in healthy horses and those with PPID is photoperiod dependent, with pronounced differences recorded between seasons and also between geographic locations with similar seasonal patterns. Most notable is a prominent increase in secretion in the autumn months, as you can see in this figure. Because of these variations in ACTH secretion, these reference intervals should be specific to location and time of the year. Most ACTH reference intervals for horses have been established in the Northern Hemisphere and more recently in Australia. Historically, the clinical pathology labs in South Africa were using data from the Northern Hemisphere adapted to the opposite seasonal pattern seen in the Southern Hemisphere. Our study aimed to generate geographically and seasonally relevant reference intervals for equine ACTH and karting in order to provide a superior diagnostic tool to improve the diagnosis and management of PPID. Our hypotheses were that plasma ACTH concentrations would show seasonal fluctuations and that reference intervals would differ from month to month. This was a 12-month longitudinal perspective study during which ACTH concentrations and reference intervals were determined from a representative population of healthy local horses. The study design was carried out in line with guidelines for reference interval studies published by the ASVCP. Research and animal ethical approvals were obtained, and signed owner or agent consent was provided for all horses used in the study. 80 clinically healthy horses were enlisted from seven properties that did not experience any disease outbreaks or general health problems during the 12 months. Inclusion criteria included being under 12 years of age, clinically healthy, and relatively easy to handle, while exclusion criteria centered around clinical signs such as hypertrichosis, polydipsia, polyuria, lethargy, hyperhidrosis, redistribution of fat deposits, and muscle wasting. The demographics of our reference population are indicated in this table. The living conditions, healthcare routine, and management of the horses that were recruited were not altered for the purposes of our study, and each remained in their owners and vets' care during the course of the study. Because ACTH is an unstable protein, blood collection and handling must be done in a specific manner, and this was performed according to previously reported guidelines and equine endocrinology group recommendations. All samples reached the lab within four hours of collection for further processing. During the first sample collection, a second EDTA sample was collected to perform a CBC and blood smear evaluation. ACTH analysis was performed on an automated chemiluminescent assay using the Siemens Emuli 2000 analyzer validated for ACTH in horses with a detection limit of 5 picograms per mole. 
ASVCP recommendations and recent modeling studies for reference interval generation statistical procedures were followed and performed for each monthly data set. Data distribution was assessed with the shapiro wolf test and was considered Gaussian when P was greater than 0.2. And before anyone gets too agitated by seeing a p-value cutoff that is not 0.05, the 0.2 cutoff was determined based on a reference interval modeling study by Labodek in 2016 to be the most accurate cutoff for discriminating parametric and non-parametrically distributed data sets for the sample size. Outlier analysis was performed using the two key and Dixon Reed methods, and identified outliers were removed after the review of the analytical and clinical data. Reference Value Advisor for Excel was utilized for the reference interval calculations. A Criscoll Wallace test with a post hoc Conover analysis was used to compare ACTH concentrations between the 12 months. This analysis was performed using MedCalc software and the p-value for this was set at less than 0.05. PVC results for all 80 horses in the initial sample group were within lab reference intervals. During the study, some horses moved off the property for training or competitions, and most of these cases returned. However, some were sold or would present in one month with a minor clinical problem. Horses were excluded in the months that they were absent or unwell, and were included again when they returned or were clinically normal. This resulted in variations in the sample group as indicated in this table, which also shows the sample size attrition, resulting in only 59 horses being included in the 12th month. This table contains all the results used for the reference interval generation. The number of outliers removed ranged from 0 to 8 in each month. A total of 19 outliers were detected, 15 horses had only one, and two horses had two outliers each. In all cases, these horses had unremarkable clinical exams and no recent history of illness, but outlying results were excluded from the data analysis. Data had a non-Gaussian distribution, and the non-parametric method was used to determine the reference limits for all months. Upper reference limits were at their lowest in early summer at 21.4 picograms per mole, with a pronounced increase of 60.6 .6 picograms per mole in autumn and tapered off to 22.3 picograms per mole in winter. The South African population showed similar temporal changes in ACTH concentrations to those previously reported in other locations. Based on the results of the Criscoll Wallace test, there were significant changes in monthly ACTH concentrations. Months with significantly different ACTH concentrations are indicated by an asterisk in the table. The average photo period for each month is indicated on the left. In this figure, ACTH data is shown by the box and whisker plots, and the average photo period for each month by the blue ovals and lines. The variation in ACTH concentrations with the changing daylight length is well illustrated here. ACTH concentrations are lowest from winter to summer or June to January and ACTH shows a pronounced increase as daylight length decreases in late summer and autumn or March and April. This tendency has been reported in the similar studies with some variations in the extent of the increase, which is commonly two to threefold, the duration that the ACTH is significantly increased for, and whether there is a second significantly smaller peak at another time point in the year. Changes in photoperiod mediated by circulating melatonin produced during the non-daylight hours in the pineal gland are responsible for the seasonal hormone rhythms observed. This is the reasoning behind the call for geographically and temporally specific ACTH reference intervals, as the geographic location and season determine the non-daylight hours experienced by the horse. The upper reference limit in this study is lower than those reported in Australian and Northern Hemisphere studies. Our current study is the only one using the Emulac 2000, whereas the majority of the other studies made use of the Emulac 1000. Both of these assays have been validated for measurement of equine ACTH. However, a retrospective study has reported an 11% negative bias with the Emulite 2000 based on unpublished data. Method-associated bias may account for some of the difference, resulting in the peak upper reference limit of only 60.6 .6 picograms per mole in this study. But these findings reinforce the point that the ACTH reference interval should be season, method, and latitude-specific. ASVCP guidelines require a minimum sample size of 40 for reference interval determination, with an ideal sample size of 120 or more. 80 horses were sampled to compensate for population attrition in order to have a minimum number of 40 results in each month. In our study, a younger population was selected specifically to reduce the risk of including early or subclinical PCID cases, as the presence of the disease in younger horses is very low, and the aim was to determine reference intervals for a non-diseased population. As there is no anti-mortem gold standard test for the exclusion or diagnosis of PCID, selection of a truly healthy, age-appropriate reference population for this disease is challenging. A recent Australian study showed that comparing basal ACTH to upper reference limit has a high specificity but low sensitivity for diagnosing PPID. Diagnostic cutoffs generated using results from both healthy and PPID-affected horses have a higher sensitivity but lower specificity in comparison. 
The upper reference limits generated here will therefore be useful to confirm disease, but may not be appropriate for screening older horses with mild or no clinical signs, as a high proportion of false negative results are possible. This is the first report establishing an ACTH reference interval for a healthy South African equine population. These findings may be relevant to other subtropical locations in the Southern Hemisphere. However, the differences when compared with Australian and Northern Hemisphere studies reiterate the call for temporally and seasonally determined reference intervals for equine ACTH, which will aid in accurate diagnosis, recommendations of further testing, and monitoring of PPID horses. The aim of our study was solely to generate reference intervals, and ACTH results from a PPID-affected population were not included. So the diagnostic accuracy of these new South African reference intervals is as yet unknown. As yet unknown. There are no conflicts of interest and funding was provided by the following groups. Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the presentation. Greetings to you all. I am Naledi Sohobela, a MSc candidate at the Department of Veterinary Tropical Diseases with a project titled Construction of Three Food and Mouth Disease Virus Peptide Phage Display Libraries for the Identification of Epitopes Recognized by Emil Zera under the supervision of Drs. Treche and Oberman. All the laboratory work for this project are performed at the ARC OVR TED BSL3 facility. Food and mouth disease is a highly contagious transboundary animal disease that affects domestic and wildlife driven host animals. The OIE ranks FMD as one of the most economically important infectious animal diseases. Examples of clinical signs of FMD include vesicles on the lower lip, hoof interdigital space, the tongue, and salivation. The etiological agent, the FMD virus, is a pathogen that belongs to the aphytogenes within the family Piconavaridae. There are seven serological distinct serotypes, serotype A, O, C, Asia 1, and the Southern African territories, known as the SET, SET 1, 2, and 3. Five of the seven serotypes exist in the sub-Saharan Africa. The epidemiology of FMD in Africa is affected by the wildlife cycle and a cycle that involves domestic animals. The African buffalo is the virus maintaining, maintenance host, making eradication near impossible in South Africa. To control the disease in South Africa, the country is divided into different uh, FMD zones. The red area indicates the FMD infected zone, while the yellow area indicates the protection zone where vaccination occurs, and the blue area indicates the surveillance zone. Control measures for FMD include physical segregation between domestic animals and wildlife, also control animal movements. However, fences are often broken down, leaving the dependence to um, vaccination. Vaccination against one serotype does not confer protection against another. The viral genome consists of a single-stranded positive sense RNA genome of approximately 8.3 kilobases and is surrounded by 60 copies of each of the four structural capsid proteins. The structural proteins VP1, 2, VP3 are externally located on the capsid. Research has identified that these structural regions contain most of the antigenic regions and the majority of neutralizing epitopes have been identified on the capsid protein. This information is important for studies on improved recombinant FMD vaccines. There is a need for improved FMD V vaccines that offer a broad immunogenic response. There is a scarcity of knowledge on FMD V antigenic regions and Identifying FMDV epitopes, which is a part of, of the antigen that an antibody binds to, is of great importance for vaccine production, um, vaccine development studies. Through recombinant reverse genetic technology, identified epitopes can be incorporated into the FMD genome where recombinant viruses can be used for vaccine production and thus resulting in vaccines that offer an improved immune response and protection. The objectives of the study are to construct the three FMDV peptide phage display libraries using the fragmented P1 capsid coding region of each one of the SET1, SET2, and SET3 serotype viruses. To identify the antigenic determinants, which is the epitopes recognized by the antibodies from FMDV infected and vaccinated animal sera through biopanning of the constructed FMDV peptide libraries. From a study of Van Weichert et al. 2004, 
and Kuku Library was used to identify epitopes. It is a large fetch meat based chicken SCV library that comprises of a naive immunoglobin repertoire of the chicken. Opperman et al. used sex specific SCV selected from the Nkuku Library to identify epitopes through SCV neutralization assay. Viruses that escape neutralization were sequenced and compared to the parental virus sequence. The change epitopes were then noted and mapped. This is a diagram showing uh, the sequence change uh, from arginine to histidine. So at position 159, arginine changed to histidine. Also here, it's a diagram showing the mapped epitope whereby um, R changed to histidine, basically um, arginine changing to um, histidine. To further investigations of SCV, my study will then uh, construct the three novel FMDV set peptide libraries. Based on current vaccines and circulating strains, appropriate representative set serotype viruses were chosen. Viral RNA was then extracted, followed by RT PCR of the P1 region. The P1 region was then fragmented using the covirus technology. Figure 1 shows a gel showing uh, the P1 DNA fragmentation of the set, and the fragments range from 100 to 600 base pairs. This is a good representation of the P1 fragmented region. The fragmented DNA was then cloned into a phage vector and transformed using E. coli competent cells. Clones were then screened through PCR to verify the insects. To date, we have constructed the three set serotype libraries. The library size was then uh, calculated and this is indicated in table one. These library sizes were more than sufficient for a peptide phage library. Figure two represents the biopanning protocol. The target in this study was the purified IgG, which was immobilized on the immunotube. The peptide phage library is then added. The concept is that regions from the said library recognizing specific IgGs will bind. The bioplanning principle is that strong binders are amplified with each round of panning while non-binders are washed off. Bioplanning is done in three to four times to amplify positive binders. A polyclonal ELISA is then used to confirm if target-specific enrichments occurred, which is then followed by a MISEC sequencing to identify epitopes. Figure 3 um, is um, a bacteriophage that is used in phage display libraries. This phage um, is capable of infecting gram-negative bacteria, including E. coli. For constructing of um, phage libraries, the gene of interest is inserted into the bacteriophage genome, which is then which then the protein of interest is displayed on the bacteriophage coat protein. Three rounds of biopanning were performed. This is an example of set one output plates showing a loan of colonies. After every biopanning round, we did output calculation to determine if there is an increase in titer from the first round to the third round. This is illustrated in table three. This shows an increase in phage per meal from the first to the third round. The graph here shows IgG panning results and the OD for 450 nanometer readings are low from the biopanning round 1 to 3. This was seen for all the IgG pennings thus far using set 1 and set 2 libraries. We are presently biopanning the set 3 library against total IgG purified from the FMDV set 3 infected sera. The SERA samples used in this study for IgG purification is from FMDV animal trials done a few years ago, and it is quite possible that the integrity of the SERA is not good. Therefore, the low OD readings. We are currently in a process of obtaining better samples. Objective 1 of the study is complete. Regarding objective two, we are in a process of troubleshooting to obtain positive binders for MISEC sequencing and epitope identification. The project was severely affected by the COVID-19 lockdown in 2020. This study will add substantial value to our FMD knowledge on set antigenic sites and significantly contribute towards the future development of improved vaccines. 
Drew recombinant reverse genetic technology. Identified epitopes can be incorporated into the FMDV genome where recombinant viruses can be used for vaccine production and thus resulting in vaccines that offer a broad immunogenic response and improved protection. I would like to acknowledge the following people and organizations that made my study possible. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me on this beautiful day. My name is Takula Chuma and I'm about to present on a study which formed part of my PhD thesis. The title of the study was The Effect of Maximum Daily Temperature and Relative Humidity on the Milk Urea Nitrogen Concentration of Holstein Cows. I am grateful to my supervisors, Prof. Holm and Prof. Fosgate, together with a team of authors as indicated on the slide. So we had two main objectives in this study. The first one being to investigate the effect of environmental factors on milk urea nitrogen concentration of Holstein cows, and we were mainly interested in the ambient temperature as well as the relative humidity. The second objective was to estimate the percentage contribution of these factors plus other factors to the variability in measured MUN concentration. Okay, let's move on to some background information. Urea nitrogen concentration in cattle has been well studied and this is because of its important association with reproductive performance of cows. It does not really matter whether one measures milk urea nitrogen or blood urea nitrogen um, as this does not influence the conclusions of the study. This is mainly because uh, urea nitrogen quickly equilibrates across all body fluids um, and if one was to measure milk urea nitrogen, it is always easy to calculate or work backward what the blood urea nitrogen concentration would have been. Um, so it doesn't really matter whether one looks at milk urea or blood urea nitrogen. Also, we know that urea nitrogen concentration tends to vary between cows. So it varies also between herds depending on their management and it also varies between breeds and this variation is mainly due to the level and the type of dietary protein. There are other factors which I'm not going to bore you with um, that also cause variability in milk urea nitrogen concentration. For example, the age of the animals, the days in milk, um, the milk production, etc, etc. Okay. Uh, Publications tend to agree on the effect of the level and type of dietary protein. However, there is some disagreement when it comes to the age. For instance, some publications will tell you that as the animals get older, their milk urea nitrogen or blood urea nitrogen gets elevated. Some report a, an inverse relationship. Um, and some applies to the days in milk. No. So here is what caught our interest the most. I mean, although many studies have looked at the influence of the diet, no studies have investigated the effect of the environment on milk urea nitrogen concentration. And we had this in mind that if BUN or MUN, uh, I'm going to refer to milk urea nitrogen as MUN and BUN for blood urea nitrogen, so if the concentration of BUN or MUN is to be successfully used to identify cows that are at risk of poor reproductive performance, then it is important that all factors that influence the concentration um, under field conditions um, to be clearly understood. This is how we did the study. It was a retrospective cohort study using data from the UP experimental farm. And we used each sampling event per cow as the unit of analysis. So data was collected over a six year period uh, from 2012 to 2017. Um, and sampling was done every five weeks for the determination of MUN concentration, as well as the somatic cell count by a private private laboratory. So over this period of time, the cattle received three different uh, commercial diets 
which were specifically formulated for lactating cattle. Daily uh, meteorological data were obtained from the nearest uh, South African weather station, um, which was uh, less than one kilometer away from the farm. A linear mixed effects model was used to assess whether the uh, environmental temperature together with the humidity were predictive of uh, the milk urea nitrogen concentration of the cattle. We also evaluated other uh, factors as main effects and uh, I've listed the other factors that were uh, evaluated here. Um, I'm not going to go through that. Confounding variables that caused a 15% or greater change in the estimates of other variables when removed from the model were retained in the model. We also did a general linear model for, to evaluate the contribution by other variables um, on the MUN concentration. Um, SPSS was used for all statistical analysis um, and the significance level was set at P less than 0 0.05. Moving on to the results, here are the descriptive statistics of the study um, where 161 Holstein cows were used. It's a bit of a busy slide if one considers the many numbers that are on the table, um, but well, such is life. It will probably get busy as we go on. Um, I think I just wanted to focus on the fact that this is a typical or a standard herd high producing herd um, with an average MUN concentration of about 14. It was basically hot and the relative humidity was also on the high side. Okay, um, looking at the predictors of MUN is also a busier slide, but like I said, such is life. Um, it basically shows all the factors that we evaluated, which were predictive of uh, MUN. Um, so I think in, in a nutshell, on the left here, we've got the variables and then on the right, which is the important part, are the p-values. Um, the table is quite long and it's spilled onto the next slide, so let me take you there. Okay, so our main uh, factors that we're interested in were mainly the temperature and the humidity, which you can see down here, both quite significant. Um, also, the interaction term between the humidity and the temperature was significant. Let me take you to the next slide. Okay, this slide then shows the various components, and this is the percentage contribution of each variable towards the variability of MUN concentration. Um, well, uh, let me just take you to a few things. The diet. We already know that the diet plays an important role on the variability of MUN data. But quite interestingly was the, 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 the contribution by temperature and humidity. As you can see, it's quite relatively high at 14% and 13% respectively. Okay, the error term was less than 40%, which uh, suggests to me that the model was stable um, and it's reliable. Okay, without wasting much of your time, let me quickly take you then to the conclusions that we came to. Okay, although maximum temperature and relative humidity has not been uh, well studied before, we came to the conclusion that it has a significant influence on the measured MUN data. And for this reason, it should be considered whenever MUN concentration or BUN concentration is used to make inference, inferences about dietary management of cows. Okay, there is no way one can just look at the diet without looking at the environmental factors because this can cause a huge difference even when the diet is maintained the same. Okay, for head managers that use previous MUN or BUN data to identify cows that are at risk of poor reproductive performance, it is important then to adjust those measurements um, in line with the current temperature and humidity. Because just making a conclusion that this cow had a measurement above 20 milligrams per deciliter, for instance, it does not necessarily mean that the effect will be the same under different weather conditions. We therefore want to even suggest that 
instead of formulating one ration for the head throughout the year, it might be better to formulate a ration for the winter and the ration for the summer months, just to make sure that the effect on the MUN is adjusted for each season. Having had said this, uh, and also considering the time constraints that we have, I want to thank you for your time. Good day, everyone. My name is Rachid Adeyemo. It is my pleasure to present to you our work with the title Antibalkin, Antioxidant and Anti-Inflammatory Activities of Selected Indigenous South African Plants Used in the Treatment of Diarrhea. This is the synopsis of my presentation. Introduction. Selective pressure on bacteria over the years has given rise to numerous strategies for their survival in different environmental niches. One of the numerous strategies is biofilm. Biofilm is a complex structure formed when bacteria colonies group together within an extracellular matrix, as described by Sandasi et al. 2011. Biofilm promotes multi-drug resistance development in bacteria. The use of medicinal plants as therapy has been in practice since time immemorial. Medicinal plants possess biologically active components used in the treatment of different medical conditions such as diarrhea. Antibiotic agents have been previously extracted from plants such as Coptis chinensis and Gali. Mechanism of antibiotic activity include the inhibition of polymer matrix formation, repression of cell attachment and adhesion, interruption of extracellular matrix generation and blocking of quorum sensing network. The goals and objective of this study is to evaluate the antioxidants, anti-inflammatory and anti activity of the selected plants. We hypothesize that the selected plants possess good anti antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activity. Methodology. Plant selection was based on previous work done in our phytomedicine unit. Plant collection was done from Nesquid Botanical Garden in Umalanga province. Plant vouchers were deposited at University of Pretoria Abirium for identification. Plant leaves were grinded and extracted with acetone. Antioxidant activity was determined using both the assays of ABPS and DPPH, anti-inflammatory activity was determined using nitric oxide production inhibition in lipopolysaccharide activated raw macrophage cell. 15 lipoxygenase inhibitory assay LOS, was used also to determine the anti-inflammatory activity as described by Junior et al. 2007. Antibiotic activity was determined using crystal barnet staining method of Sandasi et al. 2011. Graph bag prism 5 was used for data analysis using one way analysis of variance and focus of test. Table 1 shows list of selected plants for this study and their family names. This is the pictures of two of the plants selected for this study. Results and discussion. Figure 1 shows free radical scavenging activity of acetone plant extracts. The ICTT values of prolox and ascorbic acid had no significant difference. Siasia lancia and Siasia batophila also had no significant difference between the values of their ICTT. There is no significant difference between the ICTT values of prolox, ascorbic acid, Siasia lancia and Siasia batophila. So it is safe to say that Siasia lancia and Siasia batophila were as good as Trolox and ascorbic acid. However, all other plants, Siasia pendulina, Siasia leptodicta, Varina galpini, and Varina bokri, had significant difference when comparing their ICTT values with Trolox and ascorbic acid. In GPPH, there was no significant difference between Trolox and ascorbic acid ICTT value. Also, no difference, no significant difference was observed in Bowena bokri, 
compared with prolox and ascorbic acid. So it is safe to say that Bauina Bokri had, was as good as prolox and ascorbic acid. The remaining plants of Seasia pendulina, Seasia leptodicta, Seasia lancea, Bauvinia galpini, and Bauvinia batophila had significant difference in terms of their IC50 value when compared with prolox and ascorbic acid. Figure 2 shows 15 lipoxygenase inhibitory activity of the selected plant. There was no significant difference between the IC50 values of quercetin, which is the positive control, and Seasia batophila. In other words, Seasia batophila is as good as quercetin. Also, there was a significant difference between the IC50 values of Seasia pendulina, Seasia leptodicta. Seasia lancea and Bauinia galpini. However, there was significant difference between the IC50 values of Seasia batophila and quercetin when compared with Seasia pendulina, Seasia leptodicta, Seasia lancea, Bauinia galpini, and Bauinia bulkri. Table 2 shows nitric oxide inhibition activity of the selected plant. Seasia batophila had the highest percentage in nitric oxide inhibition at the highest concentration of 100 microgram per mil. This was followed by Seasia lancea and Seasia pendulina. The percentage row cell viability of Seasia batophila was high, implying that the nitric oxide inhibition was not as a result of cell death. In contrary, the percentage viability of row cells in Seasia pendulina was low indicating that nitric oxide inhibition may be as a result of cell death. Table 3 shows antibiotic activity of the selected plants. At zero hour inhibition, all the plant extracts were found to possess good antibiotic formation activity with their inhibition values greater than 50%. At 24 hour inhibition, only Seasia pendulina had poor destruction activity as the value was less than 50 percent. However, all other plants were found not to possess uh, destructive biofilm activities at all. At 48 hour inhibition, none of the plant extracts had destructive biofilm activity. In conclusion, all the tested plant extracts had good biofilm formation inhibition activity. However, they do not possess preformed biofilm destruction activity. Seasia batophila are the best antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activities. Further study is necessary to elucidate and identify the compounds responsible for the observed activities in tested plant extracts. I hereby acknowledge my supervisor, Professor Lindy Magor, the entire staff and students of Phytomedicine, University of Pretoria, that provided the ambience to do this work, and National Research Foundation for the funds. These are my references, and thank you for listening. Okay. Well, that's the end of the first session. Please may you post any questions that you have for the presenters in the Q&A. And I'd like to thank all the presenters. Those are really, really fantastic uh, presentations. And if everybody could just give them a virtual uh, clap. <laughs> Look at all the claps. Does anybody have any questions?
Okay, so we have a question from Professor Chamnora, and this is the the first the first talk that we had. Um, can you comment on the relationship between the effects of photo period on concentrations of melatonin, ACTH, taking note of the seasonal variations in no adrenaline levels? So this is this question would be would be for for Diane. Diane, can you can you respond to that? Diane, can you can you maybe please just uh, type a response in the in the in the Q and A? I'll repeat uh, Professor Chamnorwa's question. Can you comment on the relationship between the effects of photo period? on concentrations of melatonin, ACTH, taking note of the seasonal variations in no adrenaline levels. Okay, so um Dan is, Dan's response is that no adrenaline levels are not seasonally dependent. Okay, so we have another question for, we have a question here for, for Dr. Takula. This is from Dr. Snellin. And firstly, he, he says, nice talk. Um, just a comment. You may, wish all, you may wish to also convert relative humidity and, ab and ambient temperature into ambient water vapor pressure to see if there's an inf any an effect. Um, Dr. Takula, can you respond to that? Yeah. Takula, can you maybe put that in the chat? And um, all the speakers, please just note that because of the internet problems we're currently facing, please just connect with your own your own data. Hmm. Hi, Prof. Mary. I see from my side all the speakers are uh, jumping around with the internet. So I think continuing with the questions, it might be difficult. So um, with all the, our speakers can just answer those questions in the chat and hopefully we'll have that sorted soon. I think we can move over to our next session. Um, Prof. Mary, if you want to end this one, uh, then we can just move on. Thanks, okay. everyone. Yeah. But thank you very much. We are having a problem with the university internet, so please just connect using your own data. Thank you. And thank you for this session. Sorry about the gremlins. <laughs>